Nathan. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I started e-commerce on tap actually about five, almost six years ago. So Sourceify was started um, in 2017. And, you know, e-commerce on tap became a growth channel for us, right? We would interview different brands, mostly more startup oriented and do deep dives on how they've grown. You know, so you can think like feet hoodies and socks or Sunday scaries, just different niche e-commerce brands that are primarily fueled through Shopify. And, you know, then when Aaron and I started working together, you know, and as Sourceify kind of has grown its clientele to be more focused on like e-commerce brands doing you know, 10 to $100 million a year in revenue, we decided to take a different approach on e-commerce on tap, where Aaron and I actually do a deep dive on these brands. And it's been super fascinating because I think we've uncovered so many different tidbits that have really enabled these brands to scale. I mean, the majority of the companies we're covering are now doing, you know, 100 plus million a year in revenue. And just to pick apart their growth story, their founder story, their supply chain has been super fun. Yeah, I find that that is the one of the most valuable pieces of starting a podcast is you get to talk to different people or um, as experts yourself, dissect it and say, this is what they did. This is what the, these did. And uh, this is how they scaled. And I'm using terminology that I'm not very familiar with. But um, yeah, so what would you say... Um, what are the key considerations when picking a winning product category? Like if you're starting a business? Yes. Oh man. Um, I, I think it's gotta be like, what's defensible, right? So you, you you've got to go into something that uh, if you're going to raise money, you've got to be able to think that you can invest that money and grow something that's going to have an exit potential that makes it worthwhile for those investors. If you, um, want to keep it as a small business, don't raise any money, right? And just kind of cash flow that way. And so I think a lot of it is is starting with the end in mind and then picking a product category that um, that you're passionate about its potential. Um, you know, I can be really passionate about cheddar, che cheddar Chex Mix, which is my kind of go-to snack. I probably can't build a business around eating Cheddar Chex Mix. Um, but like, you know, if I'm passionate about snacking or other stuff like that, then maybe I, I do a derivative of that. Yeah, I guess I guess this is where like my loyalty to AppSumo is is they invested in me as as a creator, so I'm invested in them. Um, does that play a part in your decision? Is on um, brands you love, or brands you invest in, or work with? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you know, for the most part, I think it's kind of twofold, right? When it comes to Sourceify and I think Isba as well, you know, we mostly work with companies that have supply chain challenges. So Sourceify, you know, we source products in China, Vietnam, India, Pakistan, and really all across Asia. A lot of times, especially during COVID, you know, people weren't able to travel to Asia. And so because we had existing boots on the ground there, we became a vital resource for these companies to really, you know, make sure the products they were producing were meeting their quality standards. In today's world, companies work with us primarily for you know, kind of two main reasons. Number one, to optimize their costs or number two, to optimize their quality and meet their lead time expectation. You know, when we think about a supply chain, we typically think about cost, lead time and quality. Those are kind of the three variables that we pull on. And so I think, you know, when it comes to brands that we work with, it really just depends on the problem set that they're facing from the supply chain side of the business. And I think in general, you know, supply chain isn't talked about too much because it's not, you know, quote unquote sexy, if you will. But, you know, Aaron and I really enjoy it. And it's fascinating when you dive into a company's supply chain to see, you know, where they get in their packaging, where they're getting their zippers, where they get in their, you know, fabrics. It's really a unique and very neat process that we get to get to dive into. Yeah, you're, you're nerds in um, supply chain, just like... I guess I'm a nerd in community and podcasting. You just go dive it. You just dive straight into it. So how do you make uh, e-commerce on tap sexy for people that are listening out there? How do you uh, like engage your audience and um, what are you doing to uh, support them on their e-commerce and supply chain journey? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're still learning a lot. Um, most of our, when we were, Nathan and I were talking about this, a lot of this was just based off the conversations that we were having and things that we thought were, were interesting. And so our format is a little bit different where we aren't having the companies on. We are trying to take kind of an objective view and maybe we'll change it down the road, but 
uh, we're going through and we're reverse engineering their supply chain, we're reverse engineering, uh, you know, how they have gone to market and what their X potential is. And so, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about liquid death and just, you know, kind of as we were going through this, I had the take that, you know, I think that they, if they do exit, they're not going to exit to a water company. They're going to exit to an alcohol company because it helps them get a new type of consumer. And so uh, we just have all these different insights that, that we're able to play off one another as we're doing research and things like that. And so, um, you know, we, we also call people out. So we did a deep dive on uh, Viore as one of our earlier episodes. And, uh, you know, same with like True Classic. And we, we thought that they were, they were doing so many things right on the marketing side, uh, but they were falling short when it came to the customer experience and either the time that it took to get something delivered when we placed a test order. Or in the case of Viore, like the returns experience was terrible. I, I took a picture and put it online where I took a, uh, a, a fruit roll-up box and put my pants inside there and put a label on the outside and ship that out. And that was because like, they didn't have the right mechanics to handle uh, nice. those sorts of returns. And, you know, they're doing $400 million in revenue or something like that. So it's like, you, you got to figure these things out. So um, I, I think that there's just, there's a lot there where I'm hoping that the people who listen and are enjoying two nerds nerding out, um, can take insights and apply that to their own businesses for, you know, what they can do better at a different scale. Yeah. Do you have a, uh, thank you for answering all these questions and going into really uh, a lot of detail about how you're engaging and uh, creating your um, podcast. What kind of research goes into it? Um, what would you say are some of the biggest pain points you have right now? Because uh, every podcaster has a different journey. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest challenge at times is, is finding those kind of hidden nuggets, right? I think if you Google a brand, you see what most people would see online and, you know, the stories about them. And I think what we try to do in e-commerce on tap is kind of find those hidden nuggets, whether it be in their sub supply chain or some growth story that many haven't heard before. So our research process, you know, I mean, it, it covers an array of sources, everything from, you know, founder interviews of them being on other podcasts to you know, your typical news outlets, um, as well as test orders, you know, we, we get a lot of uh, fun products in the mail because we get to, you know, play, place test orders with these companies that we're doing deep dives on. And it's interesting to see also, you know, we've got a whole process to look up where their factories are based on uh, our boots on the ground in Asia, as well as, you know, HS, tar HS tariff codes. So it's pretty neat. I mean, there's a lot you can unlock. Uh, Aaron, am I, am I missing anything? <laughs> No, I mean, we, we do a lot. I think some of the things that, that one of the things that I've recognized as we've gone through this process is that marketing is what the companies want you to talk about and want you to feel about procurement and supply chain is what is actually newsworthy. And so a lot of times we'll go in and we'll find something where there are inconsistencies with what a company wants to be known as, or wants to be purported as. And, um, and then we're able to kind of find those from a, from an operation perspective, but, then at the same time, there are these amazing stories that come out that we weren't expecting. I mean, I, I kind of come back to the Merit Beauty episode that we did, Nathan, where um, we were going through and and just realized that uh, the founder was running three different multi-million dollar companies at the same time. Oh. And you're like, well, hold on, time out. Like, let's talk about uh, you know what she's doing and how she's doing it and what her track record is. And uh, you know, you just find some interesting things there that kind of take you into a a, uh, a spot there. I, I would also add it's impressive to see, you know, companies that reach scale that are able to keep their metrics pretty hidden. Like one that really comes to mind is Athletic Greens. You know, I would think most people are familiar with Athletic Greens at this point. And what's crazy is that, you know, their revenue numbers are, are not public like whatsoever. You know, people estimate they, they like there is no real like dialed in estimation of how much revenue that company is doing. And it's very rare to be at that scale and not have any leaks. So, you know, kudos to to their team to uh, keeping that under wraps. How do you go about accessing data like that? And um, how, what value does it have for you when um, in in for Sourceify and ISBA, but also for your podcast? So, I, I would say that we um, we're very intentional about looking for public sources of data because we work with a lot of really well-known large companies that are 
you know, have either been acquired or are in the process of being acquired, we have access to a lot of information that isn't public. And so we're intentionally saying, okay, we're not going to look at that. We're not even, we're not even going to, you know, gut check stuff. We're only sticking to what's in the public record. And, uh, you know, from a podcasting point of view, uh, you know, it, it makes for a better story if we've got a revenue number we can tie to. But in reality, you know, when it comes to the consulting business or the sourcing business, uh, we would get all that directly first party when we're working on a project anyway. So it, I wouldn't say it has a, a huge uh, impact on that end. Yeah, I, I like your approach a lot. And it was great to talk to your team as well. Um, well, I have I have some questions. So for somebody that's by because this event is kind of about AppSumo and helping people launch, grow, market and scale their business. And we're talking about e-commerce here. Um, if somebody's starting that journey, what like first steps would you say that they focus on or start doing to get started? Uh, like, for, for instance, uh, finding the first product and, and what and going back to uh, the winning product category yeah i mean I, I would think actually even before starting with a product you know kind of a bit of what aaron was mentioning before is, is tying into a community right and, and typically a community is reflected on your passion and i've seen this play out so much with you know community leading to incredible e-commerce companies like one that, that comes to mind is epic gardening right you know this guy kevin started a gardening blog grew that gardening blog to a few million followers and then started building gardening products around his community and audience. And so I think, you know, even before I would think about what product you want to launch and build, I would first think about, you know, what communities are you in? What are you passionate about? And then think about, you know, what product can I build for that community? And then when it comes to actually, you know, finding a supplier to, you know, produce that first product, I mean, that I could talk about for hours, but, <laughs> but really uh, to break it down in a quick, short summary, it's, you know, I think about vetting out suppliers, you know, typically you're going to start with like five or 10 different suppliers that you're vetting. Maybe you're going to produce three different samples and then you're going to test those samples, see which ones you like best and then, you know, place a small test purchase order and, and go from there. Right. So um, it, it's an iterative process. And you always find something new about a supplier overseas that uh, you didn't know before. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the the one problem that I have in my head because I don't have that experience is collecting inventory. Like uh, a lot of people collect AppSumo deals, never use them. Buying products, testing them is fine, but then not being able to sell or having the sales skills to sell uh, a product. What what goes into your mind? Once, once you've tested the products and then you're looking to uh, ship them and get them out there. Uh, Aaron. Oh, well, I think a lot of this is, you know, you should test into something. You should have a thesis. You should figure out, okay, I, I, I think that people are willing to pay this. I think I'm going to sell this amount. Um, and so if you are just trying to decide if you should invest in inventory or not, um, I'm a big fan of being out of stock. Right. Not not perpetually, but, you know, you can set up a Shopify page, you can run some Facebook ads, you can test something and just say, oh, shoot, we're out of stock. Join our news, you know, join this list and then we'll we'll let you know when we're back in stock. And there's a lot of brands that have launched like like that. You know, Harry's did that. We did that at Hubble, um, the farmer's dog. I mean, there's quite a few companies that that's been the playbook. And so if, if you yeah, prove out your thesis. And then once you're there, just make sure you've got the repeatable processes uh, to, to do things. And, you know, Nathan's being uh, modest. Uh, the easiest way is just to use Sourceify and, and that'll just work. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what we're on here for. But also just to talk about your podcast journey. And uh, we got the um, special code there. Um, Cast Magic have given 50% off all annual plans with the code CM. 50YR, and that's only available in, until the rest of the day. Uh, I can remember about a month ago when we did have a call, uh, you did say that you also use Cast Magic in your workflow. I'd love to know how you're using it, why you're using it, and what you like or love about Cast Magic. Yeah, I, I would say I, I, I like their user interface. I mean, I think the AI summaries are fantastic. They kind of are able to pick apart an episode and showcase the highlights, which is pretty cool. It, it just makes it a good way to, you know, repurpose podcast content, right? Because prior to Cast Magic, you know, we were kind of 
manually just writing up these these posts for social media and now with cast magic i would say it's you know relatively an automated process where we you know uh get an episode out put it in cast magic you know and then have those tidbits ready to go for social media and so it's definitely been a unlock in terms of our process yeah i think after did you get the chance to listen to blaine before this yeah you were yeah, a little bit i actually know blaine pretty well he's a, a friend of mine and uh yeah it's incredible to see how they've grown cast magic and really a fan of, of blaine and, and the cast magic product yeah it's phenomenal so um re regarding because this is an absolute event have you checked out what's on at sumo day right now and if so um which tools are catching your eye or um, if you haven't, what are some of your other favorite tools that people that are starting out in e-commerce and supply chain should um, pay attention to? Uh, Aaron or Nathan? Specifically from a podcasting point of view or from a supply chain point of view? Uh, could you do both? Please. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're, we're definitely still learning on the podcasting front. And so I think our tech stack is... Obviously, Cast Magic. Um, we Riverside. We've looked at um, what's the other one? Um, the Texas Speech one. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I don't do the. I editing. think that's the script. The script. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. That that's kind of the the, the uh, tech stack that we started with, and then we're just going to iterate and swap stuff out as it makes sense. Yeah. So what to take e-commerce to e-commerce on tap to the next one? level what are you what's the vision or what's the end goal for the podcast yeah i mean i would say our listener base is relatively niche right if, if you're not into e-commerce you're not into uh one of the companies we're, we're covering then you know it's probably not not super relevant but we're making strides within the e-commerce community you know we've got a very active uh facebook group you know we're both active on social media primarily on twitter and linkedin and um, it's been cool to see the engagement grow, right? I mean, I've been pod podcasting now for, for over six years, you know, and, and I, I think it comes in ebbs and flows, right? There's some episodes we release where it's a very, you know, unique kind of hyped up story uh, that gets a, a lot of traction and a lot of engagement. And there's others that it's, um, you know, a, a company that hasn't been as media worthy that, you know, we've thought just personally was interesting that we wanted to cover. So, you know, I, I think it just depends in some sense uh, when it comes to podcasting on your target audience and, and your community. And, you know, I think from my perspective, you know, there's different types of podcasts. You know, there's obviously some podcasts that are like Huberman or Joe Rogan that are going to get a widespread audience. And, you know, I don't think Aaron and I are that right. We're talking specifically about e-commerce companies. And for the most part, you know, the people that uh, uh, listen to, you know, these wider spread uh, podcasts are not going to really be listening into an e-commerce specific podcast. Yeah. And you touched on something important there and that it is a very small niche and you are focusing on uh, a specific area. Um, and I'd like, uh, I know you, Gabe jumped off briefly, but uh, Gabe and I are working really closely together and um I'd like to introduce you to each other. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Fantastic. All right. So you guys, you guys have your own podcast and uh, uh, for your for your business here. Now, are you seeing traction in your podcast, or you uh, you feel like you're you're it's slower than you want? Do you have an idea? Like, where are you at right now in that journey? Yeah, I would say it's growing, right? I mean, you know, I've been podcasting for six years. I've had episodes that have gotten over 10,000 listens and some that have gotten a lot less, right? So I think it goes in ebbs and flows. I think, you know, Aaron and I have been doing this specific format of e-commerce on tap just for about 15 or so episodes. So, you know, in my opinion, I don't think you can call yourself a, a real podcaster until you do 100 episodes or more. And so, you know, Aaron and I are, are working our way up there. And uh, I think by the end of the year, we're going to have an even stronger audience than, than where we're at right now. Okay. All right, guys. Well, look, I think you guys are last roll of the day here. You guys, uh, uh, listen, we, we appreciate you guys coming on so much. Um, I just want to double check here. You know what? Uh, this is a really important one here, and I think that we should definitely answer this question. 
what would you say that has been some of the most productive strategies when it comes to uh, scaling scaling revenue vertically for e-commerce e-commerce businesses? What's been some of the most productive strategies that you've seen used across various various niche e-coms? What's that? What, what do you think that that the strategies that has been the most successful is? Yeah, I would go uh, a couple episodes come to mind, but the true classic episode was probably a good one where we went and deep dove into what they had done and how they did it. Um, the TLDR is that you need to know your costs, right? If you and it's not just like rough numbers of here's what I pay in COGS and here's what I pay in shipping and in those sorts of things. Uh, but if you really truly understand all of the uh, different half a percents or, or other costs that come off of, of a sale, then suddenly you know what the upper limit is um, for what you can spend in order to grow profitably. And that's been the kind of infinite money glitch that they've come up with is, is uh, True Classic has found a way to say, all right, uh, we know that we've got $20, $25 worth of CAC that we can we can afford to, uh, to spend into, uh, maybe a lot more in their case. Um, but they they set a hard rule and say, look, we're going to break break even on the first purchase that someone makes, and uh, we are going to assume that all of our profit and contribution margin is going to come on the repeat purchases. And so, because they understand and track their costs so quickly or so tightly, uh, they know exactly what they're able to spend. Of course, they've got pressure to make those dollars go further and to you know keep CAC low. But they have have said that they're not going to spend eighty dollars to acquire a customer that has a twenty five percent contribution margin uh, because that's just not a good way to build a business. And so right. I think that that having a really hard edge where you're saying this is the maximum that we can spend, and then that that triggers all this other work to say, cool, how do I improve that? And that drives you to be more efficient. It drives you to be more. Uh, where, do, where do I find the additional margin inside of my systems? Exactly. Exactly. You, you just you push yourself to really justify all the spin that you're doing, and uh, as a result, you have a much tighter business. What do you think about people who, you know, the there's a lot of smaller. Uh, I call them, I call them. You know, n now you've got things like TikTok Shop that are going absolutely crazy, and you've got uh, kids who are trying to put together Shopify stores and just picking random products. That trying to see which one works and which one doesn't. Like, if if I'm somebody who wants to build an e-commerce brand, but I'm not sure about what what product category or or vertical I want to choose, how should I go about trying to find the right category? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there necessarily is a right category. I think it depends on the right, the, the I would say the right audience, right? You know, how are you going to make your video engaging? How are you going to, you know, continue to scale your content engine, right? I think fewer brands today are solely reliant on meta and, and you know, Facebook or Instagram ads, right? Whereas today, more and more brands are reliant on influencers, on creators, on organic content, like you're talking about through TikTok shops. And so I think really, if I think about uh, what's the right product, I think, well, what's the right audience and what am I personally interested in that I think is going to have a lasting impact that can be more than just, you know, a single product if I want to you know, create and build a real brand here. If I run into you, this is the last question right here. I, uh, I recognize who you are in the subway and I got 30 seconds for you to give me three pieces of advice on grow my e-com and make the right choices. You got 30 seconds. What three pieces of advice are you going to give me? I would say partner. I would say partner with a big creator, test the product, have them do a live or post about it on their story, and see how the engagement is before you do anything else. Mm -hmm. And then once you find that product that relates to their audience, that their audience you know loves and wants to engage with, then go find a supplier through Sourceify, manufacture that product, and launch your brand. I, I really am bullish on this creator economy. I think there's been so many huge success stories, whether it be, you know, prime hydration with Logan Paul or Kylie cosmetics, you know, there's just been some incredible stories. And I think this space is just getting bigger and bigger. So if I were going to start an e-commerce brand today, I would partner with a creator. Okay. I think that's actionable. 
And I think the creator thing is right on point because that uh, that immediately cuts out all of the hard work that you're going to have to put in in terms of, uh, uh, number one, getting the right people to even be willing to test your thing that you're trying to push. And uh, that's like ideation of that and getting the data for that. Like you're talking, depending on if you're having to jump verticals and pick product categories multiple times, you know, you're 90 days a piece every time you do that. 90 days to launch ads, see what converts, adjust landing pages, and then adjust spend and then direct, uh, you know, build campaigns, you know, that's 90 days of pop. And, and you could do that. You could do that repeatedly and spend that capital over and over and over and over. I think that the, you know, pick the big creator or the influencer is, is the hack for anybody who's willing to, is looking to scale up on e -com. That's for sure. I come with a marketing background and I've done e I've done e-commerce businesses and, or I've helped build them out online. like in terms of the infrastructure, um, I've, I've done a little bit of that over, over, you know, my two decades and, and I've seen everything in between of things that work and things that have failed. And I'll tell you the creator hack is definitely the best piece of advice that I wish I could have given them, all of them. That's for sure. So look guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. We appreciate you guys coming on and uh, hanging out with us on Sumo Day, you know, day one. So hopefully you guys are having a good time. Is there is there anything you you have to pass along to the community here before we part? Just thank you both for having us, and hope to you know hear from anyone that's interested in e-commerce. You know, Aaron and I are both active on Twitter and LinkedIn, and check out Source Fine Isba. And thank you again for having us on. This was fantastic.